Test one, two, one, two, test, test. All right, we're up and running now. I can get your mic done. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for hosting me again. I'm Dr. Clinton Coyle. I'm visiting you from Harbor UCLA Medical Center, part of the uh, Los Angeles County Public Health Care System uh, in Los Angeles, California. Uh, I visited you about two years ago and spoke about surgical site infections, and it's always nice to be invited back. It's one of the nicest compliments. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about better communication, uh, communication between physicians, with your patients, with each other, with other staff, uh, and so forth. Critical communication strategies for physicians. So I'm an associate clinical professor of emergency medicine at UCLA. Uh, for my hospital, I'm the chief quality officer, um, associate medical director for quality and safety. Uh, so in the last 15 to 20 years, I've pretty much been involved in just about every really bad thing that's happened in our hospital. Um, accidentally discharging the wrong patient, doing a surgery on the wrong body part, leaving a sponge or other instrument inside the patient, uh, patient you know, uh, attempting suicide while in the hospital, you know, all these bad events that we all want to try to avoid. Um, I know about all of them that have happened in my shop. 
Um, and in looking at each of these events and trying to figure out what could we have done differently, how can we make this safer in the future, uh, how can we build a system that makes it harder for this kind of thing to happen, in looking at that time and time again, uh, breakdowns in communication were almost always a major contributor to what occurred. Uh, and so what I'm going to try to share with you today is rather than just saying everyone should communicate better, just communicate better, just do better at that. We know that the do better, try harder strategy doesn't work. I'm going to try to share with you some very specific practical strategies that you can use while you're working. Now, I'm an emergency physician myself. I work in the trauma center at our hospital. Um, and so at least once a week, I'm doing my own patient care and struggling for myself with how do I get the right information to the right people at the right time. And so that's what I'm going to try to share with you today. I have no uh, financial disclosures. We're not going to talk about any uh, drugs or devices or specific products, and I don't have any relationships with any of those companies. So the question is, is communication a problem for physicians? So the Joint Commission, who also compiles events and knows about many, many more events than I do, uh, they look at events from all over the country for decades, and they have found that breakdown in communication is the number one most common contributing factor to an adverse event. And someone actually studied this in 2016. They looked at communication failures in US hospitals and medical practices, and they found that they were responsible, at least in part, for about 30% of all malpractice claims. Uh, this resulted in about 1,700 deaths in at least this one study, uh, and $1.7 billion in malpractice costs over five years. So th this is common. If you've had a miscommunication with a patient or miscommunication among your staff, you're certainly not uh, alone. Today, we're going to consider these three uh, populations, uh, communication with patients, communication with other physicians, and communication with other healthcare workers. So one of the problems, I think, why does this happen and why does it keep happening? Almost all of our training is about this relationship. If the patient has this physical sign, what is the diagnosis? If the patient says, patient says this, what do you say back? If they ask you this question, what is the right answer? All of our uh, licensing exams, our board exams, all of this. Uh, many of us, even when I was in medical school, they even had uh, actors come in and pretend to be patients. And we got to practice giving people bad news. We got to practice when the patient is angry and so forth. And, and we're all good at this. This is a really important part. But the fact is, this is the environment that we actually work in. And many of us, though, have not received any specific training in how to manage all of these other interactions uh, that go on. And someone was telling me in line for the uh, taco bar, someone was mentioning, oh, you forgot the extra family member who comes in at the last minute and tries to change everything, uh, which is also true. <clears throat> So I borrowed this slide from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality uh, Team Steps program, which stands for Team Strategies and Tools to Enhance Performance and Patient Safety. Has anybody here heard of Team Steps or participated in Team Steps? It's a, so it's a program from the, the US Department of Health and Human Services designed to try to give people these uh, skills. And for whatever reason, penguins are their mascot. The point is, uh, this slide indicates what the different elements of communication are. It's worth thinking for just a moment. Uh, you have the source of the information and the message they're sending. That message goes across to a receiver, and that receiver may or may not give feedback. And there's a lot of barriers, assumptions people make, fatigue, being distracted. Uh, even HIPAA can be seen as a barrier. Although the fact is, if you read what's actually in HIPAA, it says healthcare workers taking care of the same patient are allowed to say whatever they need to say to each other in order to facilitate that patient care. The uh, issue for us is, as humans, it's very natural to focus a lot on the message you're sending. When you're the sender, when you're the source, you're thinking about, what do I have to say? What do I want to tell them? I want to change their mind. I want to convince them of something. And often, we don't spend enough time or energy thinking about, what are they, what are they hearing from us, and what are they trying to send back? You may have had conversations with people where the one person is spending so much time thinking about what they're going to say next, they don't even hear what the person is saying right now because they're so busy formulating you know, their answer. So you're going to see some strategies to try to overcome that. The goal of communication is what we call situation awareness. Situation awareness is your sense of what's going on right now. Is this a patient that is having a routine procedure and everything's going fine? Or is this someone that came in for a routine procedure and now something's going terribly wrong and we're very worried and we're escalating, escalating? You know, those are two very different notions of what the situation is. Many times when there's an adverse event and we look back and we say, wow, why in the world did that person do that? You know, why did they give that medication at that time? Or why did they get that patient out of bed? For what that person thought the situation was, their actions made perfect sense. 
Uh, and so really getting everybody on the same page about what's happening is extremely important. The problem is sometimes on a healthcare team, you may have four different people who have four different ideas about what's going on. Have you seen that happen in your own practice, either in the hospital or clinic, where one person does something and, you're, and you just think, that, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, they didn't know what was going on. When you bring everyone's situation awareness together and you get everybody with the same situation awareness, you create what we call the shared mental model. And the shared mental model is the safest way to act because now everybody has the same idea of what's happening at the same time. And you develop that shared mental model through communication. That's how it happens. Let's look at an example. Um, this is going to be an exercise where we're going to talk about how your situation awareness can change and how just one little bit of information, the tiniest piece of information, can make a huge difference in your understanding of the situation. So we're going to look at three patients here. Uh, these are patients that have come into the emergency department and you have their, na their last name and you have uh, what someone has ordered. So there may have been a physician in the screening triage area who took a quick look at this patient and said, this is what I think they need. I'm going to order these things to get things rolling. So for Jackson, someone ordered an EKG, cardiac enzymes, and oxygen. For Simmons, someone ordered a CBC, urine, uh, urine HCG, and an IV. And for Bailey, they ordered a chest X-ray, nebulizer treatment, CBC, and oxygen. So I'm going to ask you, in just a minute, I'm going to ask you to guess which of these patients is the sickest, which one would you go see first, which one are you most worried about. This is a really weird question for doctors. We are never asked this. We're never asked to look at what someone else ordered and guess what's going on with the patient. But who does that every single day? Lawyers, L lawyers possibly. <laughs> Nurses, yeah. When you give this activity to nurses, they're like, oh yeah, we do this all the time. Like, we, we don't know what, if someone, if the doctor didn't talk to them, if, if no one said anything, the only clues you have about what the doctor's thinking is, oh, they ordered this, they must be worried about that, or they must think this is the diagnosis. So anyway, um, which patient are you the most worried about? There's no right or wrong answer. So some people might be worried about two. I heard a lot of people say one. Some people would say three. The number one answer when I give this talk is number one, because people see that and they say, oh, this could be a cardiac problem. Let me give you just one more piece of information and see if that changes your mind. Number one is a 22-year-old male, number two is a 26-year-old female, and number three is a 78-year-old male. Now who are you worried about? Yeah, number three, I mean 78, I mean that's like 150 in patient years, right? There could be anything going on with this person. And it's someone 78 that we're worried about their breathing and they need a nebulizer, a completely different situation. But let me now give you one more piece of information and see if that changes your mind. Number one is having chest pain after cocaine, which even in someone 22, that can cause a fatal heart attack. Number two has abdominal pain. And number three, they just ran out of their inhaler. They want a medication refill. And they're just only a mild shortness of breath. Now who are you worried about? So some people back to number two. Some people might go back to number one. Right, but your, uh, your notions of what's happening is changing. And now you need the last key piece of information. Uh-oh, number two. Number two is, in fact, in hemorrhagic shock from a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. And I have to say, you are the first person I've ever given this exercise to who recognized this was a ruptured ectopic pregnancy in, in slide number one. So very nice. <laughs> but in any case, uh, yeah, so it turns out number two was the sickest one all the way along, but didn't necessarily give us those signals. So the point of this is, when you're communicating with other people on your team, and you're like, what do I need to tell them? How much information do they need? <clears throat> Don't lowball it. Don't, don't under communicate to other people. Sometimes it's that the one or two extra pieces of information that really change the way someone's thinking about what's happening. Taking that moment to explain, oh, I'm ordering this because I'm worried about that. Or I want to do the, I'm, I'm ordering all three of these things, but this one's the most important to do first because of X, Y, Z uh, can really change the situation. Okay, let's focus in on communication with other healthcare providers. This is an issue about teamwork and communication among team members. Uh, you know who's really good at, about this are airlines. Uh, they have a bigger communication problem than we have because their team members are spread out over hundreds of miles, right? So you've got the pilot, the co-pilot, the flight attendants, the gate agents, the control tower, the other airplanes, you know, lots of the ground crew, all these different people, and that information has to be crisp and clean and it has to go through 100% accurate. When they communicate, one of the first things they do 
is they recognize, thinking about senders and receivers, that the sender of information, that the receivers may not have heard them. And this seems very plausible, right? You're sending it out over radio, there could be a, a thunderstorm, there could be anything could get in the way of that message. So the very first thing they do is that these crew on the airplane are gonna repeat back what they just heard. Now, the control tower knows what they said, they don't need that information again, and that's why a lot of people skip this in everyday life. It, you, you skip saying back to someone what they just said. You just say, okay, I heard you. Okay, I understand. But when you send that information back, it's the chance for them to check, did you get the right message or not? It's, it's not natural for us to do this. You have to make the extra step to do this repeat back, but it creates what we call intersubjective understanding, which is I know that you know that I know the heading. We should do this in hospitals and clinics. We do it with verbal orders, radiology results, instructions from consultants that you get over the phone potentially, critical values from laboratory or other studies. Um, I want to think a little bit about how protocols uh, and, and agreed upon standardizing protocols can help with communication. So here we have a nurse that's asking the doctor for orders on a critically ill patient and the doctor just went to a CME lecture about sepsis and they have all the evidence-based guidelines for sepsis care in their head um, and they're like, oh, I'm ready to go. And they say, yes, this is what I would like you to do. Um, and they rattle off this long list of instructions. And, and by the way, this, uh, these ideas have changed over the years. The slide has not. So a little bit of that's out of date. But the point is, um, they've got all this information in their head and they're trying to get it to the nurse. What are the chances that if this nurse has never heard of this before, what are the chances they're going to execute all this perfectly? And what are the chances that if this doctor's just acting on memory, that everything they think they remember is correct? The chance of both those things is low. So what we want to do instead is you want your group and your hospital to get together and say, we're going to sit down and look at the evidence and we're going to come up with a sepsis protocol that we're all going to get trained on. So the doctors all agree this is what we do. The nurses are all trained and they agree this is what we can do and can't do and this is how it works. So now when the doctor says, yes, let's start the sepsis protocol, that nurse is gonna say, oh yeah, this is what I learned this in the class, this is what we did on the last sepsis patient, this is what we did the one before that. Now, of course, our job is to customize care for the patient in front of us, and so you also can't make it a cookie cutter. That like everyone with sepsis, they have to get these eight things, and if they don't, you're, you, know, you missed it. Um, a lot of our job is to look at the patient and say, is this one of the 80% of sepsis patients where the standard protocol is exactly the right care? Or is this one of the 20% of patients where the protocol is not right for them, and this is why. This, you know, this won't work for this patient because they're also on chemotherapy, or this won't work for this patient because they're also having a COPD exacerbation. And so it's, it's our job to kind of tune things up, but 80% of the time we're doing the same thing over and over again, and the more we can agree on that ahead of time, the better we're gonna do, and that promotes communication. Here's another example. This is uh, from a, an event I know about that happened quite a long time ago, but it's an example of how these protocols can help prevent errors. So this is in a procedural area where heparin is given uh, during the procedure because there's going to be a catheter inserted and you don't want uh, to uh, clot, off, clot off over the catheter during the procedure. So it turns out there were three different doctors that work in this area and do this procedure. And one of them likes to give 5,000 units of heparin before they start. One of them likes to give 2,500 units of heparin, and one of them likes to look at the patient and sometimes give 2,500, sometimes give 5,000, sometimes give a different dose. Now keep in mind, there's no rational basis for choosing one or the other. There's only one body of evidence around this, but each one kind of has their own preference. What happens in this case is that all the staff in the area are told, you have no idea what the doctor's gonna order, give whatever the doctor says. And so one of these days when one of the doctors who likes to give 5,000 accidentally says 50,000, and we don't know why they said 50,000. It's because everybody will every now and then say the wrong thing. The wrong word will come out of your mouth. They said 50,000, and these staff that were told to give whatever the doctor says gave 50,000 units of heparin. This patient, that is a 10 times overdose, and this patient had an intracranial hemorrhage during the procedure. So we looked at, you know, how could we make it harder for this to happen? And what we did was we took those three proceduralists and said, there's no rational basis for you having your own preference on this. Can the three of you just talk to each other and come up with what is going to be the way that we do it most of the time or almost all of the time? Uh, again, there can be exceptions where for this patient, that's not the right dose. We're going to adjust, but everyone knows, okay, normally we would do 5,000, but this patient, we're doing 2,500, uh, and, that, and that's explicitly called out, uh, so everyone has that situation awareness. Now, in this case, once everyone has agreed, and by the way, they picked 5,000, 
Uh, in fact, the three, it was no problem for them to, to do this. They'd never been asked to do this before. It, it, once we asked, can you all just pick one? They were like, oh, okay, you know, is that, I didn't know they were doing that. Sure, I, we, we can agree on that. Um, once they picked 5,000, now if someone says the wrong one, the chance that these other team members are going to say, wait, wait, that's not what we do. Do, do you mean 5,000 or do you mean 50,000? We normally do 5,000. Again, if it turns out the right answer is 50,000, yes, they can order 50,000, but it's going, to, it's going to catch it if it's done uh, accidentally. Th this used to happen. I used to work at a private hospital uh, on my own, and we had uh, three different cardiologists that would take call for the cath lab for STEMI. And literally, if I had a STEMI come into the emergency room, uh, before I could order the drugs for them, I had to go find, we had this little laminated card that I'd pull out uh, to see which cardiologist was on call. Because this one liked us to give, you know, to start unfractionated heparin and give uh, plav uh, colpidogrel, and this one liked us to start something else, and this one wanted whatever. Um, and so I had to, the care I gave depended on who was on call which didn't really make a lot of sense, again, considering there's sort of one set of evidence around this. And in fact, one of the times, I literally gave the patient the wrong medication because I misread the call schedule. So I gave Dr. A's uh, cocktail and when Dr. B was on. And, and that, that was when I really was sort of like, what, what's happening here? What, why is our medical care for the same condition different um, because I misread the, uh, you know, the call schedule. And that group actually eventually ended up deciding we're all going to agree on this. Um, here's a little bit of data around, again, this comes from Team Steps, a little bit of data around how teamwork can affect patient outcomes. This is a study from Johns Hopkins. They uh, reduced their ICU length of stay by 50% by doing structured teamwork training. This is an interesting study from operating rooms. They gave the staff in ORs a survey to ask them, what is the teamwork like in your area? They would ask them things like, if someone speaks up with a concern, will they be listened to in this OR? Yes or no? Agree or disagree? Um, does everybody know what the plan is before you start the case? Um, and people would agree or disagree with these statements. They found two things. One of them, some of the ORs had really terrible teamwork, and they're here in this red bar. So people said, no, we never know what's going on. If you ask a question, you're just going to get yelled at, so we all know to keep our mouth shut. Other ORs had great teamwork. They say, oh, yeah, we, we all talk about what's going to happen. Everybody is part of the team, whatever. But this graph is actually not about teamwork. It's about postoperative sepsis. And what they found was the ORs that had the worst teamwork had the highest rates of post-op infection. And the ORs that had the best teamwork had the lowest rate of infection. Now this is amazing, right? We're talking about actually keeping bacteria outside the patient's body by talking to each other. But again, when you think about all the steps that have to happen to prevent an SSI, all the different people involved, everybody's got to have exactly the same information at the right time. So it makes sense. Uh, this was a couple studies from one of the Harvard Associated Hospitals. They showed a 50% reduction in adverse events, 50% reduction in malpractice claims through better teamwork. I want to give you, I've mentioned teamwork a couple times, I want to give you three tools that you can actually use to improve teamwork in your area. Briefing, which is for planning, huddle, which is for problem solving, and debriefing, which is for process improvement. So briefing is designed uh, to designate team roles, anticipate problems, develop these shared mental models. You can do two different kinds of briefings. You can do a unit briefing at the beginning of a shift. So you could, if you work in, a, in an outpatient setting, you could do this at your clinic at the start of the day. Say, okay, what's happening in the clinic today? Do we have any patients we're concerned about that are going to be coming? Do we have any, are we doing anything special today? Are we planning any procedures in the clinic that we don't normally do? Is anything broken? Is there one of the rooms that we can't use today? And what are we going to do? Uh, or again, you can do it in the, uh, in the hospital setting as well. Then this pre-procedure briefing is before you're going to do a procedure. You just have a quick check-in with everyone. Does everybody know what we're going to be doing? Anybody have any concerns? Do we have all the right equipment? This is distinct from the timeout, the timeout which, requ which is required and confirms uh, correct patient, correct procedure, correct site. This is a little more about does anybody have a concern? Does, does everybody know who's doing what? Um, and this could be in any kind of procedure. This could be in the operating room. This could be before a cardiac cath or interventional radiology procedure. This could be before a bedside procedure like a lumbar puncture or a chest tube uh, or anything that, that's going on. We do this in, in our setting. We do this in our emergency department before we get a trauma or critical medical run. Uh, we didn't used to do this and everybody would just kind of walk in the room and we all knew how to do our own job so there's nothing to say to each other. Why do we need to say anything? Let's just all walk in the room and we'll all just do our thing. 
but there was tremendous confusion as it would go on. Oh, I thought you were going to go run for the blood. Oh, I thought you were giving the medications. Oh, I thought, literally, with a couple doctors in the room, the nurses would tell, oh, I thought you were running the resuscitation. No, no, I, everyone knows that she was going to run it, you know, that kind of thing. So it takes us about 30 seconds, and we just quickly go around the room, we introduce ourselves and say, I'm going to be, uh, I'm running the resuscitation, I'm going to do the airway if it's needed, I'm going to put orders in, I'm getting the monitor and leads on, I'm drawing blood and getting access, I'm documenting, then everybody knows. And I'll tell you, over the past couple years we've been doing this, I've had cases where somebody introduced themselves and literally said, I'm the respiratory therapist. And I thought that person was the x-ray tech, for example, or someone says, I'm, the, I'm a rotating nursing student, and I thought it was a rotating uh, intern. Uh, you know, that was, I was going to give doctor requests to when in fact that person was a nursing student and so forth. So it actually makes a big difference. Huddles are a little different. Um, huddles are for problem solving. These are unplanned uh, short meetings to try to regain that situation awareness. And these are called not on a routine planned basis, but they're called when the situation changes. So we all had a plan. We had our briefing. Everything was rolling along. And then suddenly we decide, oh, wait a minute. This is, something's gone wrong. This is not the plan anymore. So you call this quick huddle to get everyone together and say, you know, we thought we were, we were gonna, you know, we thought we were doing this surgery, but there was a complication with the airway. We're actually gonna abort the procedure. The patient's gonna go back to ICU. We're gonna, we're gonna clear the room out and we're gonna do the next case. So let's make sure the implant we have here is for the next patient, not the one that we were gonna do because we're canceling the case. So then everybody on the team is like, okay, got it, now I understand. And people can ask questions. People can say, oh, do you want us to use the same tray or do you want us to close this one up and start a new one? But rather than just skipping along, everybody knows what's uh, happening. So technically, those planned meetings you have beforehand are called a briefing. The unplanned ones are the huddles. So technically, like when they at a football game, when they all meet before each play and talk about what they're gonna do, technically that's not a huddle. Technically that's a briefing. Um, I have written several letters to the administration of the NFL. I have not gotten any responses so far, but I'm going to keep writing. And one of these days, I will get them to change it to the briefing. Uh, in any case, um, the last thing to think about is the debriefing. This is for performance improvement, and it takes place after an event. And you talk about three key questions. What went well? What didn't go well? What will we do differently next time? This is important to do every time after you do a procedure. You can decide in your own environment what triggers the debriefing. In the OR, we do it after each surgery. You may want to, in another setting like an office practice or an emergency department, you may want to do it anytime there's a bedside procedure. Uh, we do it whenever we place the patients in restraints. Um, after the restraint event is over, we do a quick debriefing about how that went and, and what we learned. The point of this is to make it so that this feedback process, this process of talking about what didn't go well and talking about what did go well, is a routine day-to-day -day conversation. Because otherwise, if someone does something that you really didn't want them to do, that question of, oh, what, how do I tell them that? When am I going to tell them? Do I need to pull them aside? Do I need to email their supervisor? Do I need to just do an anonymous incident report? Like, how can I tell them this? That worry tends to evaporate away when this feedback conversation is just a routine part of your daily uh, practice. And so bringing up something, oh, by the way, you know, when you, um, when you took all the instruments without telling me, then I didn't know what happened to them and it messed up my count. You know, oh, I didn't even realize you were counting those. You're right, I should, the next time I'll ask you for those. You know, it, it, it makes it a much lower stress uh, conversation. So review, briefing is a planning session in the beginning, huddle is for unplanned problem solving when the situation changes, and debriefing is for process improvement after a shift or an event. Remember, anyone on the team can call for one of these events. Now I want to consider a little bit about, I, so far I've created kind of a rosy picture of everybody getting along and wanting to communicate and so forth, but we know this isn't always the case. People have conflicts, um, people make snarky comments, people are sarcastic. Um, does this have an impact on how the team functions? This has actually been studied in a randomized controlled trial, blinded trial. So this study was performed at a hospital in Tel Aviv, uh, in Israel, was published in the journal Pediatrics in 2015. They looked at neonatologists and experienced neonatal ICU nurses and looked at what is the impact of rudeness on their performance. Uh, they were randomized to be in either a rude condition or a control condition. So here's how it worked. They took um, a neonatologist and two NICU nurses, had a simulated 
sick neonate. In this situation, the uh, scenario was necrotizing enterocolitis, which is a critical illness, occurs in neonates, it's life-threatening, it's difficult to diagnose, and, and the care is complicated. They told the people, if they consented to be in the study, they told them an American expert in neonatology was going to be watching them over the internet and making comments as they went. It turns out there actually was no American expert. Uh, the comments they got were all tape recorded. So if you were in the control condition, you got neutral comments and ev you always got the same comments. If you were in the rude condition, you were going to get rude comments no matter what you did. Okay? The question is, did getting those rude comments make it harder for people to take care of the patient? So in the control condition, before they started, the fake American expert, they play a tape and the person says, I hope this is educational for everyone. They work for 10 minutes, then stop the tape and they say, I'm keeping notes we can go over later. Then they work for 10 more minutes, stop. This is a difficult case. Work for 10 more minutes and then finish. All right? In the, that, and so if you're in control, that's what you got. If you're in the rude condition, before they even started, the expert says, I haven't been very impressed with the teams I've watched so far. Okay? So a little on edge. They work for 10 minutes and then they say, oh, how, how are we doing? You people wouldn't last a week in my hospital. Okay? Then they work for 10 more minutes. I hope I never get sick in Israel. Okay, kind of a snarky comment. Um, and so the question is, do these rude comments affect how well this team takes care of the sick baby? And the answer is yes, an overwhelming impact. So let's take a look. They had um, raiders who were blinded to which condition they were watching. The raiders were, could not hear the comments, so they didn't know if they were watching the rude or control condition. They simply checked off, did they do this, did they do that? And here's what we found. So comparing different steps that were supposed to take place for diagnosis, comparing the control group to the rudeness group, they found that the rudeness group was significantly less likely to diagnose shock, significantly less likely to diagnose necrotizing enterocolitis, which was the whole point of the exercise, significantly less likely to notice the patient was deteriorating, less likely to diagnose cardiac tamponade, and their overall diagnostic skills taken all together substantially worse in the rudeness group compared to the control group. What about their procedural skills, though? Does this environment make it difficult for people to do physical procedures correctly? And the answer is yes. In the rudeness group, significantly less likely overall to perform the steps in the resuscitation, less likely to ventilate the patient. We were not bagging the patient properly in the rude condition. Uh, did not verify placement of the ET tube correctly. Did not order the right lab tests, like ordered the wrong tests because of this influence. Uh, didn't stop the central line on time, uh, and overall their technical skills were poor. So the interesting thing is they were trying to understand, so wait a minute, so you were taking care of a baby who was sick and dying, and then someone said something snarky to you, and now you didn't know how to innovate them anymore? Like, how does that work? Um, so they analyzed for other behaviors, and they documented how often people participated in what they called information sharing. So when someone would look up at the monitor and say, oh, it looks like their heart rate's going up. That's an example of information sharing within the team. And the rude condition shut that down. When people were being attacked, they felt like, oh, I'm not, you know, they, they look and they say, oh, should I say something? They're like, no, I'm just going to keep quiet because I don't want to get, I don't want to be the target, right? And then they also looked at help seeking. So when the doctor's trying to innovate the baby, do they say to the nurse, oh, can you, can you hold their head back for me a little bit? Or can you, uh, can you, uh, you know, pull their mouth corner aside or whatever? In the rude condition, people didn't want to ask for help because you don't want to appear weak and vulnerable. Um, and so that environment really made a difference. It turns out the, the lack of information sharing explained about half of the difference in diagnostic performance and the lack of help seeking explained about half of the uh, procedural performance. A couple things to consider from this study. Number one, the rudeness stimuli in this study were relatively mild. They were inappropriate. Um, and obviously had an impact, but you know things can get much worse. People can get much more personal, much more directive, um, and in these environments, uh, it, it can be worse. And in real life, our incivility comes from three sources: our hierarchy, so your supervisor, your peers, but also the clients, our patients. Right? Uh, if you've worked in patient care long enough, you've had a patient go off on you and say really rude things to you, or call you names, or, or so forth. Um, and so the point, the question I have for you is: of those three choices, your supervisor, your coworkers, or the patients, which one of the those do you think has the most impact on you? I, if people guess about one third, one third, one third. It turns out you're all right because it, do, it actually doesn't matter. It turns out that whoever it's coming from, 
it's once you hear these things, instead of thinking about the patient and thinking about the task, your brain immediately goes to, wait a minute, why did they say that? Were they talking about me? No, they must have meant something else. Wait, they didn't, couldn't have really meant that. Oh, I bet they were just kidding. No, they didn't sound like they were kidding. Oh, wow, I'm really mad at them now. Why did they say that? What am I going to say back next time? That's all what's going through someone's head instead of someone thinking about, gee, they've got an anion gap acidosis. I wonder if that's lactic acid or if that's ketones. You know, that's what we want us to be thinking about. And instead, you shift over to this big distraction. So the point is, um, let's minimize incivility that we give to our peers and our chain of command and recognize that we're going to get incivility from our patients. So we can't always control the, how the patients are going to affect us, but we absolutely can control how we're supporting and interacting with, uh, with each other. We want an environment where you have a team leader, but everybody on the team is free to bring up information, put it out there in the environment, bring up their own ideas, what if we do this, or what if we do that, or last time this happened, we tried this, um, raise concerns, I'm, I'm concerned that if we do this, this might not work, or I'm concerned if we start this medicine, the patient's going to throw up, can we get, have, be ready to give them an antiemetic, whatever. So all this information is now out for everybody to hear. The team leader then uses that information to make the decision. So it's not about questioning authority or embarrassing people or not being respectful of the person in charge, but actually it's about everybody respecting that everybody has ideas ideas and that that's what the decision maker is going to use to make that decision and when you bring up an idea that's a positive thing now about cussing okay a little bit about cussing cussing for safety okay this is a concept called critical language I'm concerned I'm uncomfortable this is a safety issue I think we need to stop okay c-u-s-s -S. if everybody agrees ahead of time these are your code words um, then everybody knows when you're not sure what to say and you're like, oh, I'm not sure what's going on here. I'm uncomfortable with what's happening. I'm uncomfortable with this medication. Um, and then you know that if you hear that from someone else on your team, you're, it's like stop and take notice. Oh, someone just said concern. What, what do they mean? What's your concern about? Uh, take these things seriously. There's many, many accidents that happen in healthcare where somebody in the room knew what was going wrong, but they just weren't sure how to say it, and they felt like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm a pharmacy tech, I can't question the doctor, or I'm a nursing student, I can't say that to the charge nurse, and people aren't sure what to say. But these statements, particularly because they're I statements, it makes them easier for people to swallow. So rather than saying, you're making a mistake, or you're doing that wrong, when you say, I'm concerned about what's happening, it makes it easier for the other person to hear and respond to. So C-U-S-S. -S. Little bit about emails. Um, a lot of things I see escalate when people, you know, you, you're going to tell someone, you know, your performance yesterday really was not up to standard and you're going to need retraining and we're going to need to hold you off from doing this procedure for a little while. Are you going to say that in an email? Or are you going to have that in a face-to-face -face conversation? If you say it in the email, you're giving the whole message all at once, and there's no chance to modify it as the information unfolds. The fact is, if you have a conversation with someone, when you send the first message, they're going to say some stuff back. And then you're going to modify the next message to answer what they said. And a lot of times, the conversation may unfold in many, many different ways. When you just drop this one big chunk of a message, there's no chance for feedback. You don't know how they're responding, um, and it makes it worse. So the point is, number one, never hit the send button when you're angry. Almost all your email systems have a function where you can write your angry message. You realize, I'm about to hit the send button angry. Stop. Hit the little save button. Okay, wait till tomorrow, open that message back up again, and if you're still angry, go ahead and send it. You have my permission. But chances are you're going to reread that message the next morning and say, oh, I'm going to, okay, I'm going to take that sentence out. I'm going to, whatever. Um, it will save you many, many times. I, over my career, I definitely have had times where I wish I had followed this rule. Um, and then I've had times recently where I've actually followed it, and I see that message the next day. I'm like, oh, I'm glad I didn't send that. Uh, remember, for a sensitive topic, a sensitive conversation. Email is better than text, because texting it's hard to type and, and easier for the autocorrect to say something weird. But phone is better than email. People can hear your voice, there's a chance for a back and forth. And then face to face is better than phone. So the more angry people are getting or the more sensitive the topic, escalate up to trying to get to that face to face conversation. And if you can't do face to face, at least do voice over the telephone. Now let's talk a little bit, our last topic is going to be on communication with patients. The patient experience gap. 
So a lot of times when patients have a bad experience in healthcare, it may not be that we did anything wrong. We may have done exactly what we were supposed to do. The gap is that it didn't match what the patient thought was going to happen or what they expected. So on the one hand, you've got the expectation. When they enter the hospital, they think they're going to be scared and worried. But when they get admitted, it's helpful and reassuring. The room is going to be cl uh, quiet, clean, and calm. The staff are going to be compassionate, responsive, and listening. A procedure, everyone's going to be confident. Their recovery is going to be pain-free, which we know that's not a reasonable expectation, but that may be what they thought. And their discharge, they're going to get really clear information at their discharge. But what may happen in reality is they enter scared and worried. That's the only thing that lines up, right? Um, but when they get admitted, it's very business-like and lots of paperwork. Um, the room is noisy and confusing. The staff seem unresponsive or not listening. They're just going from patient to patient and they don't have time for you. The procedure was scary with all these sharp instruments. People making comments about, oh, this doesn't look like the right piece. You know, well, let's just do it anyway kind of thing. Um, the recovery, very painful. And the discharge, confusing with handed this giant packet of papers not sure what's important, what's not important, not sure what the next steps are, things like that. So this is the gap we have to connect. And once you realize that, that a huge part of your job is not just to give the patient the right information or the right treatment, but to figure out what, did, what do they think is going to happen, and sometimes I need to correct that expectation. So for example, if I find out that their expectation was that they would have no pain, we need to correct that. You will have, you will have pain likely after this surgery, but we want to make sure that that pain is manageable and tolerable and not too much. Uh, and so that kind of resets the expectation. Here's a great study that illustrates how this gap can work. So they asked patients, how often did hospital staff describe the side effects of your medications? They then asked the doctors, uh, for those exact same patients, how often do you discuss the side effects of medications with patients? And here's the gap. The patients are in light gray. The patients, most of them said they never discussed side effects. But you ask the doctors, and they said either I sometimes discuss it or usually discuss it. And yet these are people, they were all in the same conversation and came away with very different ideas about what happened. Um, some of this is potentially, this is that the doctors really do think they talk about side effects, but they really don't. But they're kind of saying, well, I think I do. Or the other possibility is they were totally talking about side effects and patients didn't even realize that's what you were saying. So sometimes framing the conversation. Let me explain what the side effects of this medication could be. Uh, rather than just uh, starting in with talking about nausea and, and dizziness and whatever. I'm not sure there's any medicine that doesn't have nausea listed as one of the side effects when you read the <laughs> package. Uh, in any case, just show us how that gap can happen. I want to mention a little bit about active listening. Active listening involves providing continuous verbal and nonverbal feedback to the speaker. It assures you're paying attention. And it also helps to clarify the message as you go. So as someone, as the speaker's talking, it, it act, be an active listener, rather than just sitting there listening or just saying, uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. Um, the active listening we're going to talk about makes sure that, that you're getting the message that they're intending. So there's a lot of steps. You can, there's a lot of things you can do for active listening. You might want to reflect the message. So someone says something to you and you say, so you're saying you're not sure where to begin. You know, sometimes that helps them. And sometimes when they hear that back, they'll say, no, no, that's not quite what I meant, OK? Or that's exactly what they meant. And they say, yeah, that, that's exactly how I feel. And you're like, OK, well, let's talk about that. Sometimes summarizing the message. So you're saying you'd like more time to think things over. Asking questions. Are you, are you saying, am I, am I hearing this right? Are you saying that you don't want to try the new medication right now? Um, share how the message that affects you. So rather than telling the person what to do, well, I want you to do this. I want you to start this medication, and I want you to start it today. Instead, turn, again, turn around to these, these uh, how does it affect you. Um, we're not going to do anything you don't want to, but I'm concerned that your diabetes will get worse if we don't treat it. Okay? So now the focus is instead of that they're in trouble with you, the focus is you're concerned about them. And that really is our, should be our mindset with most patients is we're trying to figure out what's the best way to keep them healthy. And sometimes you need to redirect as part of active listening. So sometimes someone's getting ramped up and up and up and up. You know, maybe they took a medication and it gave them a bad side effect and they're very upset about that. And they want to tell you, like, they'll tell you, you know, I had no idea this medication was going to make me so dizzy. You know, I almost passed out when I was driving. I could have killed someone. I can't believe you gave me that medication, you know, so forth. They get a, a couple rounds to express that and there's a certain point where the conversation is not going anywhere. Somebody's going to say, I'm very concerned about that. Can we set that aside for just a moment 
and go over some of your other options now. You know, sometimes that, that interaction can help keep the conversation on track. So that's a little bit about active listening. This is a really fun study. They looked at whether we should stand up or sit down while we're talking to patients. This was in a primary care clinic and uh, they had doctors do whatever they normally do except on one day they put a chair in the room and they had all the doctors sit down while they took, talked to the patient and then the next day they took all the chairs out of the room so the doctors stood there. It turns out this is the actual time um, let's see, the actual time in minutes that people were in the room. And it turns out when the people were standing up, they actually were in the room longer. You'd think it would save time to not sit down, but it turns out sitting down, they actually were in the room about 30 seconds less. But the patient's perception of how long they were in the room. When sitting, doctors on average were in the room for one minute and four seconds. And when you ask the patient how long did they talk to you, they said five minutes. When the person was standing, again, they thought the doctor was there longer. I, you know, when you're a patient, I, th I guess kind of time kind of slows down. Like you've been waiting to ask these questions and you're worried about what your diagnosis might be and time kind of slows down while the doctor's there. But the people standing, even though they were in the room longer than the sitters, the patients didn't think they were in the room as long. And this makes sense, right? I mean, I'm an emergency physician. I'm kind of an expert at like walking out of the room like while the patient's still talking. Oh yes, that's very important. Yeah, we're gonna check on all that. Yeah, we'll check with you later. I'll be back in a few, you know. Uh, <laughs> gotta go. <laughs> so I get it. We can't stand there talking to them all the time. But just that simple fact of sitting down gives the patient a completely different, they don't have that sense of that, oh, I, I better talk faster because that they're gonna try to leave. You, they realize, okay, they're gonna sit here for a minute. All right. Um, and they actually have more positive comments about the doctors that were sitting. With the doctors that were standing, there was about uh, half and half positive and negative comments. The ones that sat down, people had much better experience. I'm gonna mention a little bit about the CAPS surveys. This stands for Consumer Assessment of Healthcare Providers and Services. HCAPS is the one that's been around the longest. H standing for hospitals. So this is a nationally standardized survey. It comes from CMS. It's the same one that's being used all over the country. And so patients, after they get discharged from the hospital, they get this survey in the mail and they answer these questions. There's also a CG CAPS survey, which is for outpatient. There's now an emergency department version, an outpatient surgery version. There's others, there's one for psychiatry. There's all different ones out there. There's one for pediatrics. But H CAPS and then following CG CAPS are the most commonly used surveys. And you may even have heard about in your hospital, they may have talked about your H CAPS scores or your clinic may have talked about your CG CAPS scores. The format of the survey, it's important for you to know what people are gonna be asked because then that can change you know, what, what you're gonna do. The patients are asked to rate statements with either always, usually, sometimes, or never. And the secret is you only get credit for always. So if the question is, uh, hospital staff treated me with respect, if the person says anything other than always, it means something went wrong. So usually is just as bad as never in the way the survey is structured. So we want, people, we want people's experience to be that yes, we always were respectful. Uh, a few questions they get asked. I'm not gonna go over every question, but it's important to know some of them. For, under the category of communication with doctors, during this hospital stay, how often did doctors explain things in a way you could understand? Always is what we want. How often did doctors listen carefully to you? Always. How often did the doctor treat you with dignity and respect? Communication with medications, how often did hospital staff tell you what medications were for? And how often did hospital staff tell you about side effects? Uh, during this hospital stay, how often did doctors explain things in a way, uh, sorry, this one got repeated. Uh, how often did, yeah, okay. Uh, they're also asked to rate the hospital from one to 10. And again, you only get credit for 10. So if they say anything other than 10, that means there was something they didn't like about their stay. And then a really important question, would you recommend this hospital to a friend or family member? That's often considered kind of the be all, end all, like that's the top question, because if they say they would tell their friends and family not to go there, again, it means something went wrong. If they tell people, yes, you should go there, that's a good place, it means that they probably had a good experience. The pain management questions changed. In 2017 and before, people were asked, during this hospital stay, did you need medication for pain? And if the answer was yes, they were asked, during the stay, how often was your pain well controlled? And during the stay, how often did the hospital staff do everything they could to help you with your pain? It was found that people trying to get people to have a good answers to these questions potentially gave people the perverse incentive to overuse opiates. And we know that that's not safe. 
So they found that as we're starting to focus much more on safe use of opiates and safe pain management that doesn't overuse opiates, these questions were encouraging people to go the wrong way. So starting in 2018, the questions changed. Now it says, during your hospital stay, how often did hospital staff talk with you about how much pain you had? And how often did they talk with you about how to treat your pain? So we want to make sure there's a conversation going on about pain management, but not that we necessarily, quote, did everything we could, <laughs> you know, which is sort of the opposite of what we want. I remember when I was in medical school in the 90s, the, the sort of the, the trend at that time was lots and lots of opiates. Like if the patient has any pain, you're not giving them enough opiates, give them more. Um, and, and the teaching really was nobody will get addicted to this. If someone's really in pain, it's completely safe to give lots and lots of opiates. Now here we are in 2019, and this pendulum has completely swung the other way, and now we know that that was not a safe practice, and we're really working to try to play catch up uh, and manage people's pain uh, more safely. What can you do to impact patient survey results? Yes, you can communicate clearly with the patient. That's gonna be the number one thing. And you can use some of the strategies I taught you today. What you can't do is coach them on how to answer the survey questions. So you can't tell the patient, by the way, when you leave here, you're gonna get a survey and I'd like you to answer always to all the questions. Completely not allowed. Violates your uh, agreement with CMS if you're a, a Medicare participant. You can listen to the patient. You can provide excellent service. Um, you're not allowed to ask the survey questions prior to the survey. So you can't have your own little mini survey that they get to kind of check ahead of time. Um, you can't wear a button that says always or a button that says 10 out of 10. Um, you and then the most important thing, do not give inappropriate treatments. So if the patient's asking for an antibiotic and you're certain they do not need an antibiotic, take the, the 60 seconds to explain to them. If I thought the antibiotic would help you, I would give it to you. But I really think the antibiotic will not help your cough, and it might make things worse, and might give you side effects that you don't want, like diarrhea, or even a more serious illness. So at this point, I don't think that's the right treatment. Uh, what I am gonna recommend is some uh, medication to help you with your cough, to help it feel better, but not an antibiotic. Taking that 30 seconds is what you absolutely have to do. Don't just go to, okay, you wanted one, here it is. Right? But it's been found that sometimes people really going hard after these surveys and really trying to get the best scores, sometimes just turn to, okay, fine, whatever the patient wants, I'm just gonna give it to them. Don't do that. A Little bit about service recovery. Sometimes we're called in because a patient is already upset. So we tried to give good service, but something has gone wrong. And this can happen. You know, even in the best system, patients get frustrated, there's mistakes are made, patients are upset. What, it's one of the things people really dread, like this patient wants to talk to you because they're upset. As the attending physician in the emergency department, when the patient is upset with the phlebotomist and talks to the charge nurse and demands, I want to talk to who's in charge, I'm the one that they come and get. So I get to do this about twice, twice a day, usually. I get to go talk to somebody who's upset. At the beginning, it really scared me, and then I learned this four-step plan, and to be honest, it's, it's super easy now <laughs> to do this. Step one is just listen. A lot of times what people are frustrated by is that they, they don't think anybody even understands what went wrong. So I walk in the room and I said, I heard you had some concerns, could you tell me what's bothering you? And then I plan to wait like up to three or four minutes while the person just talks and just tells me their whole story from start to finish. Now, most people will be done within three minutes. Around three or four minutes is where you gotta kinda step in and say, okay, this is like, you know, I, don't have all day here, but uh, that's which is not exactly what I'd say to them, but that's what I'm thinking. Um, but really commit yourself that I'm gonna, without interrupting and without trying to solve the problem, I'm just gonna let the person unload all of that. For many people, just that action, just having had 90 seconds or two minutes to tell you everything that happened with the, with the morphine that they got, um, that will actually solve the problem in many cases. You actually don't have to do anything else. So be committed to listening. If something went wrong, don't hesitate to apologize. And if you're not sure, you may not, you may not be apologizing that, well, I'm sorry I did that, because maybe you didn't do anything. But you certainly can say, I'm sorry you're not having a good experience here. Or I'm sorry, because that sounds very frustrating. Okay, and validate, validate what they're feeling. Then, without skipping those two first steps, those first two are absolutely essential, and if you jump to the third step, uh, you're, you're never gonna get there. And by the way, this works in marriages also, just on a side note. So you've gotta do those first two steps. The third step, now, really focus on solving the problem though, because that's the other frustration people have, is like, great, you sent this really nice customer service person in who listened and nodded and told me how sorry they are, but 
hey, I still, I still can't get my medicine. Like, what are you gonna do? How are you gonna get me my prescription? The pharmacy's closed and you're discharging me and I'm in pain, what are you gonna do? So now figure out how to solve the problem. Um, and then once you've solved the problem, go the extra mile. So maybe do something a little bit extra. Uh, for example, I get called in a lot because patients are upset because they were kept NPO for no reason for too long. Um, and often I get called in because the person says, like, they keep telling me I can't eat. Why can't I eat? They told me I'm not having surgery. What's going on? And I, kind of, I go over and look at the chart, and I'm like, you know, I'm thinking there's, there's no reason they can't eat, right? So when I apologize to them, I say we want to be extra careful because sometimes it's dangerous to have something in your stomach, but it's now safe for you to eat. I say, I am going to go bring you a snack. That's normally not my job as the attending physician, but I know where the low refrigerator is, and I walk over, and I get a cup of orange juice, and I get the graham crackers, and I walk them back, and I hand them to the patient myself. It takes me 30 seconds, but again, it, sh it just shows them that like, I took their concern seriously. So I'm not saying break all the rules and do something crazy, but sometimes just doing a little bit extra, people feel like, okay, that kind of, they, they got it, and they undid how upset I was. All right, pain management, I mentioned once, and this will be the last couple things to wrap up. This is a great study where they were already looking at how can we use less opiates. This study is from quite some time ago. I'll tell you when in a minute. And what they did was for patients who were having their appendix out, they looked on post-op day zero when they were coming out of anesthesia. And then starting with post-op day one, they required more narcotics. And then over time, they required less and less and less. In the control group, this is how much narcotic they required. In the special care group, they substantially reduced the amount of narcotic that they required. Uh, whatever's going on in the special care group, it seems obvious that we would do this. We should do this for every surgery patient if we want to use less opiates. It turns out this study was from the New England Journal. It was published in 1964. So we've known this for a long time. Um, reduction of post-operative pain by encouragement and instruction of patients. It turns out literally the special care group the doctor sat down with them before the surgery uh, and said, when you wake up from anesthesia, you're probably gonna have some pain. Your pain's probably gonna be here where your incision is, and that's normal, and it doesn't mean anything's gone wrong. We're gonna give you medication to control that. It won't all go away, but we wanna make it a manageable level, and if the amount of medication we give you is not enough and you're really uncomfortable, we can give you more. That's all it took. And that alone was enough to have people ask for much less medication because they weren't scared like, oh, I think the incision's tearing open on the inside and I don't know what this is and, and, and I don't know if, if I ask for medicine, they're not gonna give it to me. When you lay that all out for them, people had a much uh, better experience. The last thing I think about, uh, teach back. I wanna make sure I explain this clearly. Could you tell me what you're gonna do when you go home? Could you tell me how you're gonna explain this to your family? Can you, uh, uh, this can be really helpful in identifying situations where there may be a cultural gap uh, affecting communication. So people from different cultures may have different ideas about what their care is gonna be like or what's gonna happen uh, in the course of their illness. And sometimes you'll find this out during the teach back. So you're telling them, uh, you know, I want you to go home and I want you to rinse with this, this mouthwash you know, two times a day. I don't want you to take this medication three times a day. A lot of confusion between patients of this medication you need to take every dose no matter what, and this medication you only need to take if you need it, and make sure they're very clear on which is which because people get that backwards all the time. And we, we live in healthcare every day. We're so used to how everything works. For patients, it's very, uh, very confusing. So. Uh, teach back can be a really good technique. You'll find if you, you don't have time to do this on every conversation with every patient, but if you're having a complicated conversation, taking that moment at the end and say, I just want to make sure I explain this. Could you explain that back to me? I want to make sure that, that you know, I did a good job. You'll find a lot of patients, they only got about a quarter of what you said, or at least are only able to re read back to you about a quarter of what you said. Some patients more, some patients less, and so then you can fill in the gaps and say, no, no, I, I don't want you to take that medication unless you need to. You know, that kind of thing. So in conclusion, communication is central to effective healthcare delivery, and using a few simple tools can help avoid these communication problems. And this can include communication with other doctors, uh, with other healthcare providers, and most importantly, communication with our patients. Uh, thank you very much. Any questions? We're just about at time. Thanks again, and thank you for having me back.